already. And uh, I guess welcome to the afternoon, the last session of the afternoon. Um, um, hi, I'm Nolan Lake. I'm the uh, co-founder and CTO of Cumulus Networks. And I'm Mark McLean. I'm co-founder and CTO of Aconda. So let's kind of talk a little bit about where we're going to be headed today. Um, we're going to kind of talk a little bit about Neutron with VXLAN, kind of talk a little bit about the problems and challenges, um, some of the alternatives and solutions available. Um, then we're going to kind of dive into what a real-world a real world deployment it looks like and, and what we've been what we've been working on the last couple of months, and then finally take a look at the conclusions from deploying the solution um, in the real world. So, you know, kind of to kick it off, we're going to kind of dive in, kind of level set, go with a few of the basics on, you know, really Neutron story with VXLAN. Um, but before we do that, we kind of have to take a real quick primer on ML2 just to kind of make sure we got all of the primitives down. And so, you know, we've probably all heard of the Modular Layer 2 plugin by now. Um, you know, it's, it's a full implementation of the plugin. It has two types of drivers. Um, you know, one's a type driver, which is, you know, common interface for all segment types. It manages the specific resources. Um, if you have a VNI, it's going to handle the selection, or if it's VLAN, it'll handle the ID. Um, you know, and type drivers are extensible, so you have, you know, you have type drivers for, um, you know, local networking, which is really, really for testing, um, flat networking, so you can tie in with existing um, infrastructure and data center or VLAN if you have pre provisioned v VLANs, uh, GRE, VXLAN, um, and now Genev is available. And the other uh, type drive, the other driver is the mechanism driver, which is really um, for ML2, which is where a lot of power comes from because it's what enables you to connect in with um, back end. So it's, it's a common interface. Um, it manages the specific elements of communication and it supports multiple drivers. So you can have a multi vendor strategy. Um, and it's in Liberty, it's extensible so that you can, you can implement some of the extensions um, and expose them both from an ML2 perspective and also some extensions which may not, um, which may be unique um, to a particular solution. Okay, so I'm going to start with a little bit about VXLAN. Um, so VXLAN is a uh, technology, a protocol and technology that's used to encapsulate layer two packets in layer three packets. And so the reason you want to do this is it allows you to create layer two networks on top of a layer three fabric. And that's important because IP fab layer three or IP, IP uh, fabrics scale, right? The internet is larger than any data center you know, anyone will ever build. Um, and so using the same technologies that make the internet work, you can build very scalable and very reliable data center networks as well. And so the key one uh, for these purposes is ECMP which is equal cost multipathing. And it's important because now all of those links in a densely interconnected network are active at the same time. Traffic can go over all of them. And this gives you better, uh, more predictable latency, higher bandwidth, obviously, and faster error handling. Because you already have connectivity. If one of the links fails, it's just withdrawing it from service, as opposed to if you're using something, an L2 technology like SDP, where you have to do a lot more calculation um, to figure out the new path the packets are going to take through the network. There's another solution people sometimes use for this, uh, for building layer two networks, which is called MLAG. It has its own disadvantages. It's proprietary. There's no standard for MLAG. Um, it's a very complex thing to do. You're essentially intentionally creating loops in your L2 network and then doing a lot of dancing to keep that from melting your network down. And typically, you can only have two switches in an MLAG pair with most implementations. So that limits the total amount of bandwidth. It creates a bottleneck. And so, I talked about these point-to-point -point tunnels. And so you know, if, if you're experienced with layer two networks, that probably kind of triggered something, which is, well, how do I handle traffic that's not point-to-point? -point? And so we call that BUM traffic. And it stands for broadcast, unknown unicast, and multicast. And so you know, broadcast is traffic that is destined for everyone on a given network. Mul uh, unknown unicast is if you don't know the destination of the network. The way layer two works is you flood it to all possible destinations, which is essentially the only way to guarantee it gets to its uh, real destination. And then multicast, which is where it's similar to broadcast, but instead of going to everyone, it goes to only the endpoints that have expressed interest. And so there's a couple of different ways we can handle this. And we'll get into which one we chose later. The VXLAN standard talks about multicast. Um, basically, on the physical network, you create a multicast group for each logical L2 network. 
And so now anyone who's participating in that lot L2 network can register as interested in that multicast group. And so they'll only get the bum traffic for their, uh, for their layer 2 network. The other way, which we've talked about, Mark and I have talked about at previous um, summits, is a software replicator. And the idea there is every, everyone who's encapsulating VXLAN traffic, when it sees one of these bum packets, and send, ju instead just sends it off to a special replicator, which can be just software running on an x86 server or any other place. And what it does is then replicates the packet to all of the different, uh, unicast replicates the uh, packet to all the different listeners that are uh, interested in it. And the final one is what we call head-end replication. In this model, everything that is every device that is encapsulating VXLAN traffic can also replicate to all the interested uh, uh, listeners. And it can do that in hardware. So if this thing, well, if it's a switch, it can do it in hardware. So there's a couple of different ways you can deploy VXLAN with uh, Neutron. The, the kind of default one uh, is doing VXLAN in the hypervisor. And so we talked about the L2 packets being encapsulated in these VXLAN packets. In this case, that actually happens in the vSwitch. And it happens in software. So this can create some you know, performance issues, because now the software is having to append this header, basically you know, poke on each and every packet that goes by. And the big thing about networking is, to get performance, you want to make sure that software doesn't have to look at each and every packet. You want something else handling each and every packet, and software just setting kind of rules for how to handle uh, how to handle the packets. And the other problem is that you end up with a huge number of VTEPs. Now, the VTEP is a VXLAN tunnel, uh, VXLAN termination. Uh, Virtual tunnel endpoint. Virtual tunnel endpoint, thank you. Uh, acronyms everywhere. And you end up with one per hypervisor node. So if I have 32 racks, each with uh, 32 um, servers in them, you end up with 32 times 32 VTEPs. And so the, you know, the numbers scale up pretty quickly. And since it's happening in the vSwitches, there's nothing you can do to bring in, nothing you can do easily to bring in devices that don't have a vSwitch. So bare metal servers, um, you know, hardware appliances like load balancers and routers and things like that uh, cannot be connected to the logical networks, only VMs and containers. So the other way to do this is to do the VXLAN encapsulation and decapsulation in the top of rack switch. And so this is interesting because it gets you hardware acceleration, right? If your top of rack switch supports the feature, which most new ones do now, um, you can have it in hardware take the L2 packet, put that, L, uh, put that VXLAN header on it, and send it along to its destination. And so having hardware do something on each and every packet is absolutely fine, because it can do it all at line rate. Another cool thing is now the number of VTEPs scales with the number of racks. Instead, if I have those same 32 racks with 32 servers each, instead of having 32 times 32 uh, VTEPs, I just have 32, one for each of the top rack switches in those racks. And we can now bring all of those non-virtualized devices into the logical network. So your you know, bare metal servers managed by Ironic, um, via, um, you know, hardware appliances, and so on. And so the, uh, the feature that allows us to do this is one uh, that showed up in Neutron in Kilo, and it's called hierarchical port binding, which is kind of a mouthful. Um, but basically what it means is that you can have multiple different segment types, in this case a v VLAN segment type and VXLAN segment types, and they will be merged uh, using a uh, ML2 mechanism driver. So the ML2 mechanism driver knows how to talk to the switch, the top of switch to tell it to connect this VLAN going on this front panel port to a hypervisor to this VXLAN, which is going to then tra traverse the IP fabric. So I feel like I've talked a lot, so maybe a diagram would make this clear. So here you can see the kind of leaf spine layer. We've elided most of the leaves just to make the, uh, the connectivity a little less insane with all the lines. Um, and so you can see. Um, Oh, we've got a build here. You can see the, uh, the first hypervisor is going, has chosen uh, VLAN 37. So the traffic for a given VM uh, coming out, or a specific VM coming out of this will be tagged with VLAN 37. It will then hit the top of rack switch, which will then be, uh, have the VLAN tag removed and then have a VXLAN header added. In this case, it's chosen 2003. Um, as the VNI. And so these numbers can actually be much larger than VLANs, which are limited to 4,096 uh, different tags. These can actually be up to 16.7 million. Um, and then the, the packet will traverse the spine layer, which is all layer three, and land at the other uh, top of rack switch. 
And in this case, the, uh, the, the same virtual network has been allocated VLAN 55 on this switch. Now, if you're a traditional networking person, this is probably really weird to you because VLAN numbers are supposed to be global because it's a virtual LAN. But in this case, since the layer 2 boundary never leaves a, a single rack, you can reuse the VLAN numbers. In fact, in, in our case, you can use the uh, VLAN, reuse VLAN numbers between different front panel ports. So you have the full 4,096 VLAN numbers on each, for each and every hypervisor, which should be enough for decades. So now we're going to talk a little bit about um, a real-world deployment. In this case, this is done with uh, DreamHost and their new Dream Compute cluster. So they built the network on white box or bare metal switches um, running Cumulus Linux. So for those of you who don't know, Cumulus Linux is a di Linux distribution based on Debian that runs, instead of on x86 boxes like your laptop or your, your server or you know, your desktop, it runs on switches. And so a switch is basically uh, just a fairly standard looking server with one very special part, which is a forwarding ASIC. And so that's what allows it to do you know, 32 ports of 40 gigabit per second bandwidth at line rate. And Cumulus Linux, unlike most traditional uh, network operating systems, does not have a proprietary CLI. The way you configure it is the same way you configure Linux switching on a hypervisor. Use the standard Linux tools, you know, IP route 2. You know, you, you can do IP route add and then type out your little command. Uh, you can use BRCTL to create a bridge and to put ports into the bridge. So on a hypervisor, you would take a tap device and add it to it, create a bridge device, usually called BR0 or something like that, create the tap device from the VM, put that into the bridge, and then you can bridge that to ETH0, for example, to connect that VM to ETH0. So those exact same tools work on Cumulus. But behind the scenes, what we're doing is we're hardware accelerating all that. So in a hypervisor vSwitch, all the packet forwarding is being done uh, in software. All those forwarding decisions are made by software. In our case, we program the hardware, that forwarding ASIC I talked about, to do in hardware what Linux would have done in software. So this is similar to if you have a graphics, if, you, if you're old like me and you played video games in the 90s, you know, you used to have software rendering and it would draw the little, you know, game world that you're playing in 3D. And then along came hardware accelerators and you dropped one in. Everything looked kind of pretty much the same, maybe the graphics got sharper, but everything was way faster because it's being done in hardware. So basically, you can think of a switch running Cumulus Linux as a Linux box that just happens to have a huge number of 40 gig or 10 gig or 100 gig interfaces. You know, a stick kind of relatively common switch today would have 32 40 gig interfaces, and so those would just show up as 32 Ethernet interfaces. So on top of the layer two provided by Cumulus in the, and Dream Compute, Aconda is being used to um, implement layer three and above. So what we've done with Aconda is Aconda provides a layer three plugin. It's providing routing via service VMs, and then also provides additional services such as DHCP metadata, um, and then coming soon, you know, implementations for load balancing, as well as, um, and it's all based on the open source Astara project, which is the newest um, entrant into the OpenStack big tent. But Aconda, you know, while being the newest project, is actually was developed at DreamHost in 2012, and has been a project that's been in production for a while and hardened. And so it enables, you know, it enables changes like this because of you know rolling out a new architecture, as, and as well as transitioning off the old one that was used um, in early deployments of Dream Compute. The OpenStack environment, um, you know, is is based on the stable, stable Kilo release. Um, it is using ML2 drivers designed for hierarchical port binding. Um, you know, and, and essentially, it's kind of what Nolan touched on a little bit earlier with the with the hierarchical port binding is where you have VLAN between the server and the top of rack switch, and then you have VLAN um, or VXLAN between at the top of rack switches. So it, it, it's it's essentially kind of the the exact kind of sample case for hierarchical port binding. So I talked a little bit earlier about these, the concept of you know, IP fabrics and, and the, the advantages there. So I figured we could uh, have a diagram. It might make it a little clearer. So this is a, a uh, leaf spine or fat tree um, in, the, in the terminology. And so in the Dream, uh, Dream Compute case, they have chosen uh, 32 by 40 gig switches um, for the spine layer. And so what that means then is since there are 32 front panel ports on those spine switches, there can be up to 32 racks because each spine switch needs to connect to each rack. And so this scale is you know, pretty big, right? 32 racks full of you know, one RU servers um, can, can get a pretty high, pretty high number of servers. And then with all those VMs on there, uh, you end up with a fairly large number of endpoints. Um, 
And the other cool thing about the, the leaf spine or, or fat tree architecture is that it's very scalable. So we've shown right here a zero overcommit network. And what that means is that any server can talk to any other server at full speed. So in a overcommitted network, two servers in the same rack can talk to each other at full speed because they're connected to the same switch. But if you then have to talk to a server in another rack, you're going to be going through a contended, uh, congested uh, core switch. And so that's going to slow you down. Depending on the overcommit factor, common ones can be 5 to 1, you know, even 10 to 1. I uh, wouldn't recommend that. Um, so you can look at it as if I have 10 gig connectivity coming on my server and I'm going through a 10 to 1 overcommit uh, core, that means I can talk to other VMs in my rack at 10 gig, but the rack next to me I can only talk at 1 gig. So I have to be very careful about where I place my workloads so that you know, they can communicate with the other collaborating uh, servers that, that they need to talk to. So going back to, to the bum packets, you know, I, I talked about the different options, but now I'm going to talk about how we uh, drill down on how we did it uh, in the DreamHost deployment, Dream Compute deployment. Um, we did end up, we decided to use head-end replication. We wanted that hardware acceleration of the packet replication. We didn't want to have to have that done by software. And we do, so that means we are doing the replication in the top of rack switches, because in this deployment, that's where the VTEPs are. So the VLAN tag packet goes up to the top of rack switch, it's something, it's not a unicast packet. It needs to go to multiple destinations. So then the hardware looks up the list of destinations and sends one copy of it unicast to each of those destinations. So now the IP fabric side only ever has to see unicast packets. And so I kind of glossed over something there. I don't know uh, if anyone's going to call me out on it. But I said it, it replicates it to all the people, uh, all the other uh, endpoints that need to know about it. But how did it know? So the answer there is a pair of very simple Python programs that we wrote. Uh, they're open source. Um, one is called VXRD, which, again, is kind of a mouthful. We like these uh, kind of mouthful acronyms for some reason. And so that's the VXLAN node registration daemon, which is probably clear as mud. What it does is, as a VTEP, it keeps track of which virtual networks, which VNIs in the terminology, this particular VTEP is interested in. And so that means, in our case, this specific case, which uh, what virtual networks are connected to VMs that live in that rack. And so what it does with that information is it sends it to the VXSND, which stands for the, well, it doesn't stand for anything really, it's the VX Node Database Service. And so what it is is a simple program that runs in, um, well, it can run anywhere. In, in this case, uh, well, I'll get into that. Uh, it collects all that information from all of those VXRDs. So now it knows, it has a global database over all the VTEPs of which, VNI, which VTEPs are interested in which VNIs. And then it pushes that information back down to the VXRDs. And so now the VXRDs know, hey, for all the VNIs I care about, all the ones that are associated with VMs running in my rack, here's the list of other endpoints that are interested in it. And that's all the information it needs to program the hardware to do that replication uh, at, at line rate. So I kind of glossed over where they run. It's, in this deployment, it's actually extremely straightforward. The VXRDs run on the VTEPs, which are the leaf switches or the top of rack switches. The VXSNDs, to reduce the complexity, we just figured, hey, run them on the spine switches. Keyless Linux switches are just Linux boxes. So any software that runs on Linux in a Linux server, you can run on the, uh, the, uh, the switch. And so in this case, I think we drew it kind of as every spine switch runs it. Typically, in a normal deployment, you'd run it only on two or three spines. You could run it on more, but they're not particularly resource intensive. You only need more than one for high availability. And if you lose you know, more than three spines, you probably have other problems. So one of the questions that comes up, you know, hierarchical port binding is really a mouthful. Is it really complicated to deploy? And if you take a look at the config file, that's actually you know, the entire config file necessary um, for ML2 and Neutron. Um, it includes both the plugin and the agent file all collapsed into one. I mean, so if we kind of walk through it, you'll see, I mean, basically at the top, we're just saying our default network is VXLAN. Um, and then we go through, say, the type drivers we want available, and then the mechanism drivers. And if you notice, we're running both Cumulus and Linux Bridge. Um, reason we have both those mechanism drivers enabled is because with hierarchical port binding, you're going to have a, um, you have to bind each of the segments. Um, so the Cumulus uh, drivers will take care of binding the VXLAN in the switches and notifying the switches. The Linux Bridge driver will take care of notifying the hypervisors which, uh, which VLAN ID has been selected and, and pass that information along to the agent. 
Um, within that, you just have your standard configurations for you know what what the network, which what what's the physical network name in the, within the rack, which we just called RackNet, um, which ranges are available to be used. Um, and then there's a going towards the bottom, you have a little bit of extra information in terms of for the agent. Basically, you've told the agent that VXLAN is not being enabled because one of the challenges with Neutron is there, it's so configurable that sometimes you can turn on a couple configs and you have to turn some things off selectively, which is why you'll see VXLAN enabled faults when it's actually on um, for the Cumulus. And then you'll see down there's the VLAN information, which has a little bit more specific information, as well as for the bridge itself, you have the physical interface mapping. So within the actual hypervisor, it maps the um, the, t the physical network name onto the actual interface. And then lastly, it's just a collection of when it's time for the, the Cumulus network driver to notify the switches, it's going to basically call out the APIs, and that's the last kind of config. But I mean, really, that's it. It's, it's, it's amazing for something complex that the configuration is really simple. Yeah, I mean, this configuration here is almost all of this is boilerplate. You know, things like enabling the firewall driver, you know, that any, any ML2 configuration is going to have that. Similarly, you know, the agent, you know, uh, root wrap and things like that. That's, that's pretty much everything. The only things you pretty much, that the only things you have to customize is if you want to use a different VLAN range in that top rack to hypervisors, you can change that. There's no real need to. Um, and the other thing you have to change is you have to put the IP address of all the switches, all the top rack switches uh, in that last part, the ML2 cumulus part, uh, just so that ML2, the Neutron server, knows how to talk to all the switches. But pretty much all the rest of this you can cut and paste right in. Um, so, you know, that's, that's just one part of the solution, though, of course. We still have the VXSND, which, um, given its uh, great name, you may have forgotten, this is the database server. <laughs> And so its configuration is very simple. It basically needs to know its own IP address so it knows what interface to bind on. It could, we could just have it bind on all interfaces, but you know, for, I guess, safety or cleanliness, we, we'd like you to specify a specific IP to bind on. And then you um, enable VXM listening. Uh, so this is for a different mode. If you're using this thing as a software replicator, you set that to be true. In this case, we're not using software replication, so you set it to be false. And then the uh, agent that runs on the switch, which you know, takes these commands from, the, from ML2, from the Neutron server, also has a pretty simple configuration. In this case, we've thrown cleanliness to the wind and bind to all ports and all interfaces. Um, and we've specified port 8140. Um, I believe that actually might be the default, so we may not have even needed to specify that port there. And then we tell it what local interface to use for originating VXLAN packets. So this is the interface, this is the, I'm sorry, IP address to use for uh, originating VXLAN packets. So for those unicast packets that get encapsulated, this will be the source IP. And similarly, for those replicated packets, this will be the source IP. And the final piece is you have to tell it which interfaces um, to ignore. In this case, EAT0 is the management interface on the switch. And so obviously, we're not going to be sending uh, VXLAN packets out of that because we're only using that to manage the switch. And the other is SWP1. In this config fragment, we only have one um, port going up to the fabric. In a real deployment, you'd have a few more interfaces there. We're going to clean that config up a little bit. I think we can eventually get this down to just the local bind. And then the last piece of the kind of uh, uh, Neutron-specific part is uh, the VXRD. This is that registration daemon. This is the one that runs on the VTEPs and tells the database uh, what, um, what VNIs it's interested in. And so in this case, we need the service node IP. That's the, the server running the, uh, the database server. And then we need our own source IP to bind to and, and to use when sending the packets up. And then the last part is that head rep equals true. That's turning on head-end replication. If you're using software replication, you'd set that to false. And then the last piece of the puzzle, you know, I talked about an IP fabric. Sometimes people will get a little, you know, freaked out about uh, routing protocols. This is the entire routing protocol config. Um, you know, you may not recognize most of these, some of these commands. That's actually a okay because you can just cut and paste this whole thing. Probably want to change the password. Um, and you might need to, to fiddle with the interface names if you plug things in differently. And you'll have to pick your own um, ASN, which is the address space number. The good news about that is you don't need to know what that means. You just need to pick a number there and use it everywhere. Um, and then the last piece is that, that IP address. That's the only piece that needs to change for each and every switch. So if you have some templating engine or some automation tool, it is extremely easy just to blow out this template, changing that IP address um, on all of the spine switches and all of the leaf switches in your network. And so, results. So we did all this work. What did it buy us? So 
One, we've moved the VTEP to the hypervisor top of rack. So, you know, we've greatly reduced the number of, of VTEPs in our system. And so you may be wondering, okay, you know, that's kind of cool, but what did that buy us? Well, it increased bandwidth a little bit. Before, with the software VTEP, you can get about two gigabits per second um, uh, using VXLAN. And the reason for that, without getting too deep into the gory details, is a NIC feature called uh, TCP segmentation offload. The big problem is most NICs today don't know anything about VXLAN, but they do know about VLANs. So this optimization has to be turned off when you're using VXLANs, but can be left enabled when you're using VLANs. And so it's apparently a pretty uh, significant optimization because it gets you a good you know, four to five X uh, speed increase. And it's proven at scale. You know, you can build fairly large networks out of this. I think you know, it's pretty much as large as you'd want to be a single OpenStack cluster. And it allows you to fully, fully utilize your capacity. You know, the, by building an L3 uh, fabric, an IP fabric, you can use ECMP to enable all of your links, the ones that something like spanning tree protocol would disable in a layer two network. So that's it, any questions? Do we have the microphone? Um, We'll repeat it. Yeah, we'll repeat it. Yes. How do we do L3? Um, where? Oh, so in this case, the question was, uh, where do we do L3? I'll let uh, Mark field that one. So the question, yeah, so with L3, Aconda is actually providing the L3 service. And the way Aconda works is um, Aconda will distribute the the router, the logical router instance, will actually instantiate the logical routers within the fabric within, um, so in the case of Dream Compute, they're based on service VMs, so those VMs are actually running alongside other workloads already in the Nova Compute cluster. So in terms of upgrades, it's actually pretty easy because you can go through, um, you, can update the, you can update the control plane, and also with DreamHost itself is you can take that image in the appliance that's used for routing and actually do a rolling upgrade over time and replace those um, you know, in, a, in a nice, seamless way and keep traffic up. So are they running with a service? M microphone. Microphone. Oh, are they, running, are they running in a compute node on each, as a service VM in each compute node, or...? They're running on some of the compute nodes, not on every compute node. Um, it really, so within the configuration, you have the router. Um, they can be paired with VRP, and so you can get failover, and you can, fail, you can go through and roll them and upgrade one at a time. Um, and, and, but it's really depending on how they're scheduled within the compute cluster. So okay. likely, yes, you do have them, but not every, te every tenant's traffic may not necessarily be on the same node as its router. Okay. So I'm trying to understand the packet flow. Uh, mm -hmm. And the other question I had was, how do you allocate the, you know, the local VLANs on each rack? What do you guys use for that? Because you, I think the example was 155 or something of that sort. Yeah, so the local allocation is basically when, when it comes time to bind the port onto the host, the um, driver will go through and look at the available VLANs for that particular hypervisor and then select one um, within the allowed range um, mm -hmm. and then mark it as in use. And then okay. so it will, it will repeat that process on, you know, and so that gets you the first, like if you spin up a VM, you, when the port's bound, it's going to um, allocate and bind it all the way up to the switch. And then when you spin up another endpoint somewhere else, it's going to do the same thing. But because the pools for um, values are different between each host, you know, you may get the same one, you may not. It's kind of unpredictable that way, but... Um, so, but then would each compute node do the same allocation in the same rack, or would it be different on each compute node? So let's say I have a VM on network one on mm -hmm. compute one, and then on compute 10, the same VM on the same subnet comes up. Yeah. So. That's actually kind of can, one of the more yeah, I, interesting I, I, features. I can talk to that a little bit. The, the way the Linux bridging model works is mm -hmm. you, um, you essentially have a, you know, interfaces, right? Like in normally ETH0, ETH1, ETH2, whatever. Uh, we call them SWP1 for switch port. Um, but if you create a VLAN, basically you're creating a, a sub-interface. So, you know, VLAN 100 on ETH0 would be ETH0.100. And so this is kind of a separate interface. It is a separate interface. And so if I create a bridge, I can very easily bridge ETH0.100 with ETH 1.200. Mm -hmm. And so now I can you know, choose whichever VLAN numbers I want as long as I kind of keep track of them and make sure that all of, the VLANs, all of the VLAN numbers in that rack that I want to be on the same network are connected to the same bridge. And then 
to connect it to other racks, we connect a VXLAN interface into that same bridge. And that has the VNI uh, for that virtual network, for all, and, and that is global. But of course, that space is 24 bits, so you have a lot more of those. Interesting. I, I didn't get that, but I'll. So the other, th other question I had was, you guys are using Linux bridge, so what happens to security policies and uh, ACLs and all that stuff? Because so security group, I mean, security groups um, are spoofing all the standard things that you, all the standard features that you find now work as expected within Neutron. So, but on Linux bridge, how do you apply the OES flows and all that stuff? Sorry, what was the last? So, I mean, I meant to say uh, the Neutron security rules and stuff without OES. How do you enforce those so with the Linux bridge? So the interesting thing right now is if you're running OVS today um, from the reference implementation in Linux Bridge, they do the same thing. They're using NetFilter um, okay. to enforce so, all the security group policies. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other question I had was, uh, so you talked about the VX SND, right? Mm -hmm. Or those services. Uh, how do you replicate state in case of failure? Or, or for example, let's take the case of a VM migrating from one rack to another rack. How do you determine the topology there? Yeah, so you know, Neutron, uh, well, OpenStack knows when it migrated a VM from one rack to another, and it tells Neutron. So it'll see the VM disappear in one and pop up in the other. And so then the new VTEP will register its interest with the, the database and will show up, and the old one will eventually age out. And so for a brief period of time, the, the packets will be unnecessarily replicated to the old destination, and they'll just be dropped there by the hardware. Okay. And then the, uh, the mesh you create within your switches, does it happen automatically, or is it or, or how do you detect, let's say, if I, if I bring up a new rack, for example, how do you connect to? So all the racks are connected to the spine layer, and it's just a routed mesh. So we, you can use OSPF, you can use BGP. We're using BGP un unnumbered in the, in the DreamHost case. And I forgot to men uh, uh, mention that. Um, the reason that config file for BGP was so simple is because instead of having to assign a subnet to each pair of interfaces between routers, you just give each router switch a, um, a single IP address, and it uses that to communicate with all of the uh, other kind of uh, uh, routing protocols. Okay. And the uh, last question I had was, uh, in the ML2, I saw a bunch of switches. Yeah. So do you, uh, so f when, you, when, I, when I make a Neutron API call, do you talk with each of the switches to provision? Is that right, or uh, yeah. so is my to, understanding right? Or? So, so you found one of our hacks. Yes, today we would send it to all of them. Um, we have, uh, we're working on a change to uh, learn back from the individual switches which hypervisors are attached to them, and so then we can prune it and only send it to the, uh, the ones that need it. Uh, but for you know, relatively small deployments, it, you know, having to replicate a short message 32 times is not a big deal. But yeah, the rollback is a problem, though, in case things fail. What, sorry, what's that? In, in case things fail on a 32-node switching, if, you, if two of them fail for whatever reason, then you'll have to start rolling back on all the rest of them, right? Um, so, I'm not sure I understand this. I mean, when, you, when a Neutron API call comes in, if you're uh -huh. talking to, let's say, 32 oh. switches in your fabric, yeah. you need to take off transaction rollback and you create atomicity. Cream. and Yeah. So, so we're going we're, we're gonna to clean that up a bit. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, right there. I'll repeat the question while uh, the, the yeah, microphone. So back to so the question is, uh, you show that there is a cumulus uh, mechanism. mechanism oh, here we go. Yeah, no, thank you. So the question is, um, in the slides, you show a cumulus uh, mechanism driver. Mm -hmm. That, if I understood correctly, is the ele software element that uh, makes the configuration on the cumulus switch so that the VLAN is mapped to the VNI. Yes. Okay. Now, I, what is not clear to me if is this mechanism driver is uh, already upstream in OpenStack, or if you get it with the when you buy the Cumulus Linux license, uh, or if it is uh, yet another product. So like it's not upstream yet. It's up on our GitHub. You can download it today. Um, we're we're working on upstreaming it right oh. now. You download it from our GitHub and then you know copy it into your you know plugins directory or ML2 mechanism drivers directory. But it'll be upstream soon. Uh, okay, so it's so new that it's not been like uh, published yet. Uh, well, it's published on our GitHub. It's not been upstreamed yet. Ah, uh, uh, okay, okay. Yep. And and uh, so all the um, documentation it will uh, be like um, integrated uh, on the Cumulus documentation or. Well, it'll probably be in the Cumulus documentation, and also in when it's upstreamed, it'll be in a different repo now because the mechanism drivers, the MLT mechanism drivers, have been split into different repos. Um, so you know, the, the core Neutron no longer has any vendor drivers in it. Okay. 
Thank you. What's the actual, uh, from Neutron's perspective, what is the network type of the tenant network? Is it still a VXLAN segmentation ID, and then, or is it a VLAN so segmentation the network, ID? So the network type will report back as VXLAN. Um, from the tenant's perspective, they'll see it as a VXLAN network. And that makes sense, because the, the VLAN numbers could be reused in different racks. So the only number that uniquely identifies a logical network is the, the VXLAN uh, VNI. Okay, so and so at that point, are you are you eliminating the the whole VXLAN tunneling between between virtual switches, and it's just basically going to going to do all that stuff, but directly through the TORs, right? Yeah, the the virtual switches only work in terms of VLANs. The the bridging between VLANs to VXLANs happens in the top rack switch. Okay. Is there any question in the back? Yes. Sorry, could you repeat the question on the microphone? I couldn't. couldn't so when it. you have um, two different logical switches within the same tenant connected to a neutron router, which in this case is going to be an Akanda router, uh, the packets will have to traverse the entire fabric, reach the Akanda router, get router, and come back in, right? Um, there's no like distributed routing. So in this particular case, if you're routing between two different uh, between two network segments of the same tenant. Um, yep. Attached to the router, yes, it will traverse the router, or it will traverse the two routers. Where it, it's um, it's not DVR. Um, you know, in other in other modes, you could run DVR on it, but and for this particular case, that's not because okay. of some other operational concerns. Aconda makes it easier in terms of rolling out new appliances. That's that was kind of the choice there. Uh, just one more other question: uh, In this current deployment, um, how many physical interfaces does each server have? Does it have like two 10 gig interfaces connected to two cumulus switches, or is it? So this particular deployment is um, on the data plane side, single attached. So there's one connection from the uh, from the top RX switch going to the um, server for carrying kind of tenant traffic. Uh, it's it's kind of a more of a public cloud use case. Um, we can actually support MLAG, which. Um, you, you end up with two top rack switches, and so they're paired as an MLAG pair. They appear to be a single switch to the hypervisor, just shows up as a bond, and then the same L3 to, uh, L2 to L3 uh, transfer happens in the pair of top rack switches. So now the rest of the network is still L3, so the MLAG is, is limited entirely to a single, um, a single rack. So you don't have that looping problem you have when right. you build large MLAG networks. So with the MLAG, you would be able to support this entire architecture that you just mentioned? Um, yes, so a new feature in 2.5.4, Cumulus okay. Linux 2.5.4, is the ability to run VXLANs and MLAG at the same time. OK, thanks. How does the north-south traffic work from the service VM? Does it go over a VXLAN tunnel and just pop out on, on the WAN somewhere? or? Yeah, so there's a uh, L2 gateway currently in use, and that connects into the rest of the routing infrastructure inside of DreamHost. Um, one of the two things with Aconda is the each of the individual service VMs is actually is actually speaking BGP um, north to announce reachability information for the tenant um, segments. So within that information, it's learned, um, and so you get routing both ways. Cool. Any other any other questions? One over there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, it's close to the mic. You're next. <laughs> sorry. Uh, is there a roadmap to have a distributed layer three at the top of rack switch? So instead of just doing bridging from VLAN to VXLAN, um, like, can you support routing as well? Well, so the um, current common hardware platforms, uh, the, the forwarding A6 uh, chips, um, can't route once a packet has been decapsulated. Um, so uh, today, no. Um, new chips are coming that will support being able to route out, and then we could, in some configurations, you know, have that tenant to tenant traffic be hardware routed um, as well. But today, you have to bounce through the VM or through an L3 agent if you don't use the Conda. Thanks. Um, so coming back to what you refer to as your little hack by. Um, <clears throat> 
addressing all the switches with the port information for the hypervisor. As far as I can remember in the configuration, you specified on the hypervisor a particular port where you are connected to the upstream and all the switches. So if two hypervisors are connected to the same port on different switches, how do you differentiate? I mean, for something like P6, I'm having a little so trouble. the question, if I understand it right, you say if uh, two hypervisors are attached to the same front panel port on different switches, um, yep. how do we differentiate them? Um, so within that, um, the driver and the way it talks to the REST API is it, it the switch learns the host attached to it. And then when, when it comes time to bind, um, when we flood the switches with information for binding, um, we're able to say, if you have this host attached, you know, the switch will know which front panel port it is, so that way you can actually have different... Uh, oh, are you, so are you, you asking you're how the switch knows which hypervisors are on which port? You're using LLDP or something. Yeah, we, today we use LLDP. You can also configure it statically with a config file if you don't want to use LLDP for any reason. Yeah. Okay, understood. Um, no, I was just uh, a little yeah. bit confused because I mean, since there was an actual port in the configuration mentioned. Yeah, somewhere. so today if, if you don't specify the list of hypervisors, it assumes you're using LLDP and tries to connect to the oh, LLDP. Okay. Um, you know, it does make sense to me to have the L2 agent that's running on the hypervisor report up to the switch it's attached to, you know, who it is, um, but that's not there today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, I guess. Oh, we have a question over here. So how do we handle IP multicast traffic? Um, so the the routed fabric, the physical network, does not handle multicast. So you know all of the problems that are associated with um, you know routed multicast are just go away, right? Uh, you know you don't have to run PIMSIM or, or any of the kind of multicast routing protocols. And so the way that act then gets handled is that um, the uh, head end replication will take care of it. So if a VM sends a multicast packet, it goes up to the top of rack switch, which then knows, hey, the following other six racks have other VMs that are in this logical network. I need to send that multicast packet to all of those, um, all of those other top of rack switches so then it can send it down. And so the, the replication, it actually works fairly similar. And it actually uses the same hardware inside the chip that is used in multicast. You know, that's how we do the head end replication in hardware. Um, so it, it's very similar in terms of how it happens, but it means you don't have to run another routing protocol. But but uh, the VNI only check the layer two. If if you have uh, you know um, we don't do IGMP snooping across today. different VNI. I mean, uh, so it, um, different VNIs are in totally independent. So a multicast packet on one VNI will only go to other racks that are interested in that VNI. It will not go to other racks. Yeah, but but. But if, if you have multiple VNI belong to the same tenant and they're, they're, they're in the same IP domain, they could have a layer three, the IP multi, multi group, right? That well, you'd have, to have an IP, uh, you'd have to have a multicast router between the different uh, VNIs associated with a single tenant. Okay, so you're going to run. They're different on two networks. Are you going to run the PIM or uh, to those kinds of protocols? You could. I'm not sure. What, <laughs> I, I'm not sure I understand the use case. It seems. You know, if, if you have a bunch of VMs that want to multicast with each other, the easy thing to do is put them in the same VNI in the same logical network. Hmm. Okay. Here we go. Okay. All right. Well, thank, thank you very you. much.